Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the Education and Skills Committee focus group session on youth work. Um, I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by my colleagues Daniel Johnson, MSP, Ian Gray, MSP, and Beatrice Wishart. I'm Claire Adamson, convener, uh, and um, we are delighted to be joined um, by Tim Frew of Youth Link Scotland, Mark McGeeky, Head of Partnership and Sustainability at Youth Scotland, Kaledi Noon. Intercultural Youth Scotland, Kerry Riley, Chief Executive and National General Secretary YMCA, Dave Spence, Chief Executive Scottish Outdoor Education Centres, Neil Young, we're hoping will be joining us if he hasn't already, Youth Team Leader of the Church of Scotland, Katie Doherty, Chief Executive of Scout Scotland, and Louise Goodlad, Senior Head of Partnerships, the Princess Trust in Scotland. And I'd like to invite someone from uh, is it Tim who's going to give us a briefing on the YouthLink Scotland report? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, firstly, can I thank um, the Education and Skills Committee members attending the session today and uh, for their welcome there as well from, from Claire. Um, it's great to see, um, from my point of view, how the Scottish Parliament and its committees are continuing to function and provide this kind of support, scrutiny and challenge that is, uh, is really important in the democracy in these unprecedented times. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about our report, which was a very early look at the COVID-19 crisis and its impact on youth work and young people through the lens of Scotland's youth work sector leaders. And um, I want to thank all of them who contributed to it. The survey was uh, a high response um, and it combined local authority managers' views and those of the voluntary sector chief officers. And before I attempt to summarise the key findings, I think a bit of background is important. Um, before this pandemic, at the end of 2019, the sector had identified significant cuts, millions of pounds in terms of youth work services since 2007, and had through the Invest in Youth Work campaign, um, called on local and national government and all funders to protect and grow the youth work sector. And the campaign was noted in Parliament and had two specific calls uh, to strengthen the statutory basis of youth work and to return investment in youth work services to pre-austerity levels. Um, this issue was flagged at the cross-party group for children and young people as well in February, which was attended by Richard Lockhead. And in discussions with CLD partners and the Deputy First Minister and other Scottish government officials, um, a number of these issues have been in discussion. Um, the commitment by the Scottish government to work with the sector to co-develop a national youth work st uh, strategy uh, building on the legacy of the Year of Young People is a matter of record um, and we continue to work with officials around these. In terms of the report, four key things to note. First and foremost, um, this report was published soon after the crisis began and it paints a concerning picture of the impact of uh, COVID-19 on young people. Um, so one in two youth work leaders believe that there will be a detrimental impact, uh, detrimental impact on young people's mental health. And this echoes the, the lockdown lowdown survey, which Scottish Youth Parliament, Young Scott and ourselves did with two and a half thousand young people. Um, I think you heard about that at your last meeting, so I won't go into detail on that, but two in five young people being moderately or extremely concerned about their own well-being, and 96% of young people worrying about the impact of the coronavirus on their future. And this echoes what youth work leaders have been telling us in terms of issues of um, isolation, anxiety, um, concerns about uh, learning loss and social interaction. Um, and the youth work sector leaders have also been identifying particular challenges for specific cohorts of young people, such as those in poverty, LGBTI young people, BAME young people, and looked after young people, and those with particular health issues. The second thing I think the report highlights that is in the midst of this crisis, the youth work sector really has stepped up pulled together and shown tremendous agility and resilience. Um, and in a recent letter from the Scottish Government, it was commending the CLD and youth work sector for that agility, resilience and adaptability to respond to the needs of young people in their communities. Um, and there's been a range of things on the go. Food banks, coordinating community hub support, promoting volunteering, um, youth participation and voice, stepping in for other sectors such as social workers when um, some of their staff have been furloughed. Uh, repositioning services in terms of digital learning and guidance and the report notes that 92 percent of our sector have um, been offering online services of some kind um, and they re repositioned their their offer very quickly around that 
We've also connected with vulnerable children and young people um, and provided counselling and guidance. Now, we know that less than 1% took up the offer of support um, uh, children and young people in schools um, initially, um, but it didn't stop youth work reaching out through detached work and through digital services to many of those young people. Um, a third thing to note then is the challenge of digital inclusion, and this has been well documented elsewhere, and there are a number of gov government initiatives around that, such as Connecting Scotland. Um, but for the purposes of this report, it is worth noting that despite the youth work sector's laudable efforts to reposition services um, and some support around training, there hasn't been a, a big investment um, to support that development um, in, the, in the industry. And 60% of local authority managers identified digital barriers to providing services to young people. And some of these are self-imposed barriers. So it, things like Zoom and other tools that youth workers could be using with young people being kind of barred in terms of the use. So I have written to the, the Deputy First Minister and the local government directorate about this issue and, and kind of waiting a response on that. The fourth thing to note, and it's the most important, is that there is a significant and stark reality facing the sector in terms of funding. Um, and I can't overstate that. So the, the sector has been agile and responsive, but it can't be maintained because there, there is an income gap. So national voluntary youth work organisations in Scotland are facing an immediate income loss of 20.5 million. On top of this, over 70% of youth work leaders in both local authorities and voluntary organisations believe that there will be cuts to services and budgets after COVID-19 in local authority budgets and in the voluntary sector. So it's real concern um, for the future as well as the, the, the medium term. And ensuring this continuity of, of business and longer term viability of services is absolutely crucial for the young people um, of Scotland. Um, a number of uh, you know, voluntary organisations have taken up the opportunity to furlough some staff, but actually you know, we need them delivering activities and services. And if the income was, was there, that could be happening. Um, and local authority staff have been amazing um, and continued in, in many different ways, but in, in some instances they have been diverted into other activity and we really want them to be doing um, kind of youth work. Now I imagine there'll be some scratching of heads, you know, um, you know, government have invested £350 million um, to councils, charities, businesses and community groups. There is the third sector resilience fund, but I think what you'll, you'll hear today is that a big chunk of the problem for the voluntary sector in particular has been the loss of activity income, fundraising income and investments have declined and this this has led to some organizations being concerned that they might need to shut out door centers uh, unfortunately the criteria for accessing the third sector resilience fund hasn't plugged some of these these gaps um, so this is an issue for local government national government but also charitable funders as well some funders have been hugely flexible in terms of uh, their resourcing but there's still concern for the medium and longer term will some of the emergency response to COVID-19 also be there when we're looking for youth work funding um, as part of our, our core business. So to summarise, there is a, a hole in the bucket and the watering can of funding earmarked to support the initial crisis isn't going to fill all of that. And in some cases, it's it's not being poured into where we, we need it. So I want to finish with some questions. Um, what is youth work's value to Scotland and the education of young people particularly? And how might the youth work sector respond in terms of especially education recovery, um, uh, taking us beyond the narrow definition of blended learning? Now, we know that youth work has a social return of investment of at least £656 million and up to £2 uh, uh, billion pounds in Scotland um, through research that we've done. Um, but we need to think about the cost in terms of young people's mental health and well-being, the increasing um, uh, poverty related attainment gap, support into employment for the future. Um, so these are all things that, that we want to be be thinking about. And finally, I think it's worth remembering that for all of the that youth work can contribute to um, Scotland's um, civic recovery, there is an issue of increasing demand for youth work services um, and we don't want a decreasing supply. Youth work first and foremost is about providing a safe space for young people to have some fun with their peers and a trusted, loving adult support, uh, supporting them. And I think we need that now more than, than ever. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Tim, and, and can I just say thank you very much for the, the report and the work that went into that. It's been, been really helpful. Um, I think uh, the questions that we wanted to cover, I, I think, have been, have been distributed to everyone. So I'd just be looking for people to, to, to come in on those key points of the impact, um, the future impacts on young people and um, uh, just a situation if you have any issues particular for your own area and to my 
colleagues, if you indicate as well, I'll bring you in if you've got supplementaries during the course of that. So um, I'm seeing an indication from Katie Doherty first. Thanks, Katie. Hi there, thanks very much. Um, and thanks, Tim, for that introduction. Um, I will mostly focus um, my contribution at this point on, on the last point that um, Tim raised um, around the, 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 the funding gap issue. But before I get to that, just to say that scouting has adapted, like all of the other charities here, we have adapted um, and we've moved our programme online. We're delivering a fantastic programme online. And we know as well, comparing the, you know, the experience many people are having with education, how important as well is that that online programme includes a direct interaction between adults and children and between children and young people and their friends. We've actually done a, a deal with Zoom and we've provided a free pro account to every one of our groups across Scotland so that they can um, have their beavers and cubs and scouting um, extended um, sessions online on a weekly basis. And we're now delivering our recruitment and our training of our adults online. Um, our groups um, on the ground have been able to access the business support fund if they have premises. Now, but this again, this illustrates the, the, the difference in how the impact is affecting young people in that it's not equal. So those area, groups in the areas of deprivation are unlikely to have premises and are therefore not able to access that kind of funding. We've worked with the Ganaki Trust and we're now providing a resilience fund of our own to our groups to help them in, in these kind of areas. But our main problem has, is our national infrastructure, and that's where we provide safety, safeguarding, adult training, insurance, all these critically important but not very exciting things that organisations need to have in order to run safely for young people. And we have exhausted every avenue trying to get funding support to fill the gap of the money that we've lost from being un unable to trade, run our outdoor centres um, or fundraise. The Scottish Government have confirmed, you know, we are, we've been rejected for the Third Sector Resilience Funds. And we've also now had written confirmation that no outdoor centres in Scotland will receive any support. 37 centres got together to speak to the Scottish Government on the 29th of May. And we got our, uh, we got that confirmed in writing, I think, on Friday that there will be no financial support there. So we as an organisation are currently consulting with our staff um, with a view to um, reducing our headcount by 50% over the next couple of months. And that is phase one. If we cannot operate, if we cannot open our centres and we cannot resume face-to-face -face scouting, we will have to cut further and we'll be looking at reducing our, our headcount by a total of 70 to 80%. That's, that's the reality of this funding gap. And whilst for a while, face to, you know, local groups will continue meeting, as, we, as those adults, you know, uh, turn over and how we train them and so on, it won't just be that they can no longer go camping or go to residential centres. The adults won't be trained to take them for hikes in the Pentland Hills and things like that. So the future will be a lot of chippy walks, but outdoor and adventure will decrease substantially if we can't safely train our adults to do it. And that is that is the absolute reality. And we're one organisation, and I won't speak for others, but I know that many other similar organisations are days away from making the same types of announcements that we are. So that that's that's where we, where we are at the moment. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for laying out um, the the position at the moment for for the scouts. Um, I do have Kerry and Calida wait, waiting to come in, but. Daniel has indicated. Daniel, um, do you want to come in briefly with your issue? You're on mute. mute. There we are. Great. Um, sorry about that. Um, so a, a couple of brief uh, follow ups. One is on, on a very practical level. Katie, you mentioned there that you're, you're rolling out Zoom. Uh, we've heard a lot from local authorities that you know about the, the difficulties they've had in terms of using electronic platforms for, and, and they normally cite safety. I, I'm guessing that you've got around that and, and it may not be to go into detail now, um, but it would be useful if you could sh share the details of, of, of kind of how that's being deployed, because certainly there's practice there that, that clearly 
is being missed by other places. But on the on the substantive point there, in terms of the 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 the, the confirmation that you received on Friday, can, can you just, I mean, what engagement have you had, uh, with you know, from government? I mean, what contact have you had with ministers regarding your your, your situation? Okay, so we've been repeatedly writing to ministers since um, early April. Um, roughly, it's taking about six to eight weeks before we get any response. And most of them have simply told us to apply to the Third Sector Resilience Fund, even though our letter was pointing out that we'd been rejected from it and we were looking for um, discussions about whether that could be widened. We, the only other um, interaction that we've had is that um, we were part of a large sector meeting of outdoor centres with many organisations which met with government officials on the 29th of May. Now that is being described, I've seen in letters from ministers, as ministers meeting with scouts, guides and boys brigades to identify supports and how they're looking at what support we can provide them. But that was a sector wide meeting specifically about the crisis in the outdoor education centre market. And we got a letter from those officials on Friday confirming that um, there would be no funding support and um, advising us to apply for loans. So that, that's the, the um, interactions we've had with ministers, although the Children and Young Persons Minister um, has still not replied to us at all. OK, um, I'm going to bring um, Kerry Riley in from... Uh, sorry, YMCA. <laughs> YMCA, thank you, Kerry. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, maybe if I can just... Um, come in on the back of, of Katie um, and just to give a bit of clarity about the third sector resilience fund, the reason why so many of us have been rejected is because we had more than three months of reserve so we were well managed charities um, and effectively one of the conditions for the third sector resilience fund was you had to have less than three months reserves which is normally a minimum that's what's required for a, for a well managed charity. Um, but I think the other the other challenge is that the outdoor centres are not only used by the scouts and the guides and so on, they're used by so many other youth groups. I'm sure many of you will remember your time in youth organisations when you went on residentials and, and you know, the loss of these centres would be absolutely devastating to, to youth work, to that bit around personal development and support um, for young people. But I think um, picking up on what Tim was saying about... Um, one of the big challenges that we're finding for YMCAs um, is the earned income challenge. So, for example, a lot of our YMCAs run out of school care, after school care, childcare programmes, which are an income stream for them that then allow them to do youth work um, uh, and, and to support their core funding. And I think they're really frustrated in terms of um, not not being able to see clarity about when childcare can resume, but also um, up against the challenge that because that's been devolved to local authorities, they're at the end of the queue behind all of the local authority services. Um, and so and so feel like in some places they're not getting that collaborative approach that should be happening in terms of service delivery. And I think it's all very well having a third sector resilience fund, but it, but in the same way as you know, the Scottish Government is arguing around furlough, there needs to be um, a recovery funding as well, so that when the pipeline of income that is generated and earned income isn't there, there needs to be a way that these organisations, the third sector youth work organisations, can have some recovery um, in order to be able to, to look to the future. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Calida. Um, she'll appear on the screen as Maeve. Please don't let that throw you. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi. I, I'm not sure if you can see me because my, my green light's not on. Um, we can't at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if uh, there's anyone who could offer you some technical support yeah, with it's, that. Um, it's saying video sharing is disabled by the administrator. So. Oh, um, okay. We do have support on the call. So um, if you don't, what I'll do is I'll bring in briefly, I'll bring in Mr Gray and if your technical staff could be looking to see if there's a reason for that or maybe message in the chat to help Khaled out and uh, I'll go to Ian Gray. 
You're on mute, Ian. Still on mute. Apologies. I, I just wanted to pursue um, Katie's point there a, a little bit more. That I mean, that's very disappointing and uh, to hear. And as Katie knows, we've also written on the behalf of of organisations, including the Scouts, to the First Minister. But I don't think we've had any uh, answer to that either yet. So um, it, it, it really is um, a pretty poor response, pretty shabby response. But I wanted. To, to just get uh, to a bit more of the detail of the position that the Scouts find themselves in. I mean, two things to ask. One is, I presume these staff um, are currently furloughed, but I also assume, though, that the organisation has to um, uh, give, give them uh, enter a consultation period if you're considering redundancy. So it's not a case of being able to wait until the furlough scheme ends. Uh, am I right, is, is the question. And the second thing is, um, obviously, the most important thing is the, the people themselves and what's happening to them. Um, but the centres are physical centres as well. So what, what measures are you going to be forced into taking with regard to the centres? Because presumably, if you have to dispose of them, then the situation becomes completely unrecoverable. OK. So can I, can I ask everybody not speaking to put themselves on mute, please? And I'll bring Katie back. OK, um, so we currently have 80 percent of our staff furloughed and um, we are trying not to lose the full 80 percent. So the, the initial consultation is around um, reducing the, 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 the staffing by 50 percent. And that's not just centre staff, that is other and um, that, that is, you know, there will be youth workers that will go in that as well, because when furlough ends, we are then responsible for the full costs of employing those staff and because we cannot generate any income this year and because we are concerned about our ability to generate a membership fee next year we have to reduce our costs in order to ensure that we still exist next year it's 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 that simple we have to, we have a duty to make sure that scouting is still is still there so projecting ahead whilst we have we don't know when we can open our centers we don't know when we can resume a face-to-face -face scouting we have to make some assumptions and that is that we have to reduce our costs in order to not run out of money because when we run out of money you know the most we could ever get out of the resilience fund is a hundred thousand and that will keep us going for about three weeks so we, we have to reduce our costs and yes you're quite right we have to do a consultation so we are we're consulting with staff just now we're taking our time over it we're going you know as long as we can because we still hope that at some point we might actually be able to resume operating and if we can resume operating we can generate money and then you know we we don't have to lay all these people off but it, but it might the, the where we get to by October is if we aren't operating and the furlough scheme is end, and if we can't see um, when these centres can reopen, then we will have to properly close them and, and start disposing of assets in order to protect you know, the rest of the, the organisation. So our current cuts have these as theoretically viable should we be allowed to operate them. Um, but when and how that will ever happen um, is completely unclear. Uh, can I bring Khalida back in? We're not going to be able to see her, but we can hear her, hopefully. Thank you, thank you. Sorry you can't see me. I think it's because I'm on my Twitter's account. I've not used the Teams yet. So uh, thank you. Um, can I just start? It's difficult with me, uh, for me to begin without mentioning what black people are experiencing in the world and the trauma that has not only been seen, but completely felt by young black Scots in, in Scotland. In, in to cultural East Scotland makes a plea to keep in your mind throughout our COVID-19 contribution that the devastating impact this is having on our young black and brown Scots. Um, I, um, I, I need to begin um, pointing out that the current reports or surveys do not include the genuine voices and experiences of BAME youth workers or BAME young people in Scotland. 
we have clear evidence that decision makers, the learning and wider community, including Scots, Scotland's youth provision, continually overlooks being young people, which results in tokenism and decoration, which ultimately has a devastating impact on being young people in Scotland. It is clear that there's a gap in providing cultural appropriate research to gather the experience and perceptions of Scottish being young people. It would be in the committee's interest to extend the review, have a series of committee meetings to have specific focus for BAME young people. And although with great intentions, white led organisations are talking on behalf of BAME groups and this must stop if we want to see a change for BAME young people in Scotland. If Parliament is committed to a human rights based approach, we must speak directly to, to, to young people with lived experiences. BAME groups don't have equitable right to sustainable funding from the national budget and there is limited funding dedicated for COVID, anti-racist mental health services and education, which has, which has contributed to the lack of availability of resources devoted to young BAME Scots. The programme of austerity, austerity is an institutionalised racist policy which has been passed directly to us. It would be in the committee's interest to extend this review. Organisations who work effectively with BAME groups are not funded appropriately and they're not given the opportunity to provide recommendations and sustainable services, especially during COVID and with the murders of innocent black people. There is lack of cultural appropriate services and role models in youth work and education. BAME voices are not being supported or heard. We need to recognise and acknowledge power dynamics and equity in services provided. Intercultural Youth Scotland are here and have the genuine voices of BAME young people, but we may not be around in six months due to having no funding to continue. We need support to ensure that our current services continues. Intercultural Youth Scotland has been working in consultation with our youth anti-racist ambassadors and their peers during current COVID-19 crisis. We are having to commission a robust report on the impact of COVID-19 with particular focus on education and the 16 plus young BAME school leavers. Although this work is not funded, the report and recommendations will be available at the end of July. Local authority grants for children and young families have not funded adequate BAME youth provision, it's almost zero for 14 to 19 year olds, despite Intercultural Youth Scotland's campaigning over the last year. Even before COVID and the murders of innocent black people, councillors highlighted a gap in BAME youth service for 13 to 19 year olds. But despite meetings, deputations, highlighting several case studies of racist hate crimes and attacks in Scottish schools, evidence of under-reporting, evidence of teachers not following, following procedures. Local authority failed to dedicate any funding in this area for the next three years and in particular services with a focus on black young people. Apart from IYS Intercultural Scotland, this service is non-existent and with the impact of COVID-19 and the murders of innocent black people, this will have devastating consequences and there seems to be no targeted interventions for this. Thank you. Thank you, Khalida. And um, uh, please, we will look forward to, to, to getting a copy of that report in, in July for the committee and it will be shared with other committee members. Um, can I bring in Dave Spence, please? Hello there, thank you. Um, I hope you can see and hear me all right. Um, I just wanted to partly reiterate um, what Katie was saying there. Uh, we have also uh, furloughed 90% of our staff but we have also this week embarked on our consultation about the likelihood of redundancies. Uh, you're right about uh, the centres, Mr. Gray. The uh, you know we we have a, a year of trading. We would have generated 1.4 million this year. A great deal of that would have gone towards the rolling maintenance of the centres. Uh, that has been wiped out uh, through lack of trading this year, and we don't expect it to get much better. There is a suggestion that things might come on stream more quickly. We might be able to open again more quickly than we thought. However, I don't think that necessarily takes into account the lack of confidence amongst parents and perhaps teachers and other youth work professionals about taking children away this year. We could really be going for a year without work. Um, 
Well, there are things that we are trying to do. We were trying to set up other things, but it's unlikely to make up the shortfall, given that uh, you know the period from uh, uh, spring uh, to summer is the period when we generate about 70% of our income. We're very seasonally uh, affected by this. Um, I'd just like to say that the, um, the uh, outlook for the residential sector prior to lockdown was not uh, very good. I think that uh, several centres had closed or were signalling that they were to close. Uh, I, we are definitely staring at the demise of the residential experience for young people in Scotland. And once the centres have gone, they will not come back. We are unlikely to have the money to bring them back. So it is a particularly serious situation. But there are specific reasons why it has been in decline, and I'll be happy to talk about them at some time if you wish. Thank you. Is, is that okay? Sorry, that was me. I was on mute. Sorry, because I ask everyone else to mute if you're not speaking and bring in Louise Goodlad, please. Hi. Um, so I just, um, I suppose, want to echo what others have said in terms of the, um, you know, the impact on income, um, specifically that in unrestricted income that charities so rely on, as Katie said, for those kind of central support services within a charity and that's certainly where we at the Prince's Trust have seen a huge impact um, from the current crisis and I think um, I would agree that the, we haven't been able to access the government support either um, not through resilience fund we also did try for the well-being fund but I suppose um, as we often see the well-being fund felt very much for new activity and very much that piece of the activity itself, not necessarily the support that goes around that activity to make it happen, which um, so often, you know, nobody wants to pay for the um, for the boring parts of the organisation. But without those boring parts, the exciting, new, innovative activity at the front line can't actually happen. So um, but I would agree with that. I think I just wanted to go back to some of the stuff that that Tim spoke about from the report um, and just specifically kind of in terms of impact on the the types of young people that we work with, um, similar to others, we have very much pivoted to digital delivery and we really welcome that there's been a lot of um, focus on digital poverty and device poverty. But I think it's just to highlight that for many young people, it's um, that there is more barriers than that in itself. And, you know, my fear is that there's um, a sense of if you get access to a laptop or an iPad, then the problem is solved. And I think what we are seeing is that you know young people are struggling um in many cases they find it this quite an intense experience to be in these kind of especially if it's one-to-one -one, but even in this um kind of setup you know they they're reluctant to put their camera on they're finding it quite an alien way to communicate so um you know we're struggling with engagement with some vulnerable young people who just aren't comfortable with that and i think you know it's really important that we um and we also must remember that some young people don't have a safe or private space at home where they get time and the luxury to kind of do this kind of exercise. So that's something we've also found. So we're really keen to, to really look at face to face again. Um, how do we get those young people? Um, you know, a, blend, a blended approach is, is fantastic. And I think it's really exciting the opportunity to do more on digital. But I think we have to remember that it's going to be key that we're able to do both. Um, and that's um, something that we are looking at. And I think there's questions around, you know, key worker status for youth workers, just getting a sense of some kind of advice and guidance that's shared across the sector in terms of getting back into centres. Um, and then the other thing just to mention, if I'm not jumping ahead, was I think there was a question that was around education. Um, and how we can have youth work as part of every you know, part of every young person's offer. And I think there's just um, obviously I recognise that for, for everyone and for schools, this is an incredibly trying time. They're trying to manage current student cohorts. They're trying to think what what is the world going to look like post summer? Um, but I think, you know, we actually got advised by a local authority just this week. Don't ring schools. They don't want to hear right now because they're too busy. 
And I feel like there's a real gap out there in terms of somebody who is um, making sure that we join up that youth work offer. You know, you've companies, you've organisations like the Prince's Trust putting a lot of investment and time and energy into some fantastic digital products. And I know lots of us are doing that in digital delivery. And it seems a shame if, if the schools are trying to reinvent the wheel as well to, to kind of re-engage young people who they will have lost because of this period of disengagement. There will be young people that just won't come back because they've they've had, you know, four months of, of not being part of that routine and not having the, that goal setting. So it feels to me like we're really missing an opportunity to really innovate, to use some of this learning and youth work to really support young people after the summer. Um, but certainly for us as an organisation, we're just really struggling to get through the door. We're just not getting engagement. And, and it's kind of who could be that um, conduit to help education look outside of itself for solutions and not just lay it all on the schools that they have to solve everything themselves. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, obviously, um, we've, we've been looking at curriculum for excellence for a long time and hearing how, um, you know, um, non-traditional qualifications are as important to a young person's development as as other areas. So we've been looking at, at schools that provide Duke of Edinburgh awards uh, as part of the, the curriculum, you know, third sector organisation being in there, being part of the, the key delivery of, of the school. So I'd be interested to hear as you come in um, whether or not that, that has stalled and from what Louise has just said, it looks as if it may, may have stalled completely in many places. Um, I've also got uh, another question from my, my colleague Daniel. I'll bring Daniel in just to, to add those two points and then we'll move on and I'll bring Kerry in after that. So Daniel. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really a very similar to point to yours, Claire. I mean, I'd be interested to hear, you know, from you know, from broadly from people here, what contact they have had um, from, you know, whether it's at local authority level or from uh, government level in terms of the ability of your organisations either to provide point expertise or indeed to supplement uh, the capacity uh, within the, the, the education system itself. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of focus at the moment in terms of, you know, the physical capacity, but also super, supervision and teaching capacity within our schools in terms of blended learning. Uh, it, 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 if no one is talking to you, I, I would suggest that's slightly disappointing. It, it, you know, is that is that the case that, that, that there hasn't been contact or, or have some organisations been contacted? Yeah, I think Louise has answered that already. I'm going to bring Tim in just on that point, please. Thanks. Uh, no, great question. And I think um, it is important to say there's a lot of you know collaboration going on between youth work and schools. And we have many youth workers that were part of those community hubs as well. And um, they were brought in as well as teachers doing that kind of work. Um, in terms of the Pupil Equity Fund um, and the kind of you know, listening of the sort of arrangements around around some of that funding to, you know, be responsive. I guess what we'd have been looking for is a, is a discussion around how to do that. So um, wh what we have had is, and I've, I've written to um, the Scottish Government about this, about the lack of our involvement in the education recovery planning groups. Um, and uh, have had a response to say, you know, that, that that question has been asked back within government. How are we more involved? How are we more involved? But it, it was a little bit after the effect. So in terms of blended learning, in terms of a recovery curriculum, some of the key strands where um, a youth work offer, especially with the summer programmes and the and the you know detached and evening activity and after school activity and STEM activity and award programs like Duke of Edinburgh, Youth Achievement Awards, many of these programs have been repositioned digitally as well. So there's a real opportunity to make more use of that. Um, and I, I I feel from my you know conversations with government officials, it's 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 one of these ones where they they've moved fast and haven't involved us, you know, but I do think that you know, I've made the point and um, I'm hoping that, that that will 
um, you know, we'll get more involved in some of those discussions, but where it really has to happen is at a local level. Um, so we have as a sector met together um, a COVID-19 recovery planning group to talk about the youth work and schools offer again, to build on some of the work that we were doing with the Scottish Government around tackling the um, uh, poverty related attainment gap and the capacity and the impact of the sector around that. I suppose all of these things are dependent on the funding question again. Um, and so it takes us back to that place. If we've got local authority workers um, doing food parcels and food delivery rather than kind of informal education support, you know, it's it's both those things together we need. We need more. There's demand and for both there's a demand to help out in that very, you know, emergency way in terms of food and food poverty. Um, but equally, we need to be, you know, stepping into the space of, of informal education and learning and a lot of discussion, as I'm sure this committee is aware of, around blended learning. And I think it, what we want to, the point we want to get across is that we're not a kind of stopgap or a filler for, for schools. You know, we, we all want schools to come back fully, you know, fledged. Um, but just remember that it's also youth work as well. This is part of the wider educational offer. Um, so um, that kind of experience, the cultural experience, the you know, link to sports, the um, achievement that can happen for young people and the link into transition and employment programmes as well. Um, youth work, um, you know, Princess Trust, many other organisations not even here that we're mentioning have a big role to play in that in that space. Um, can I bring Mark in who wanted to, uh, to comment on the face to face aspect of what's happening and getting back to that? Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was uh, just um, building on the point that was made earlier about um, young people accessing so many services at the moment by digital means. Um, and ultimately, that has been a great way in which uh, youth workers and many of Youth Scotland's uh, member youth groups in particular have been able to continue engaging with young people. But what we are increasingly finding is that, that in itself is causing a bit of digital burnout, I suppose, for one way of describing it for young people. They're getting turned off by absolutely everything being done over a screen. Um, and I suppose one of the concerns that, that we have as we move into uh, hopefully schools returning in some way, shape or form um, in August, either by part time blended learning or hopefully if it, was, if it does become full time. Um, how are we preparing young people to return into that environment when they have been out of it for a particularly long period of time in um, an environment that where they're only engaging with people in this um, digital way, uh, which I think we would all agree is is quite alien to most of us. It's not how we would choose to, to operate as our everyday um, interactions, particularly when it comes to youth work, which is primarily a face-to-face -face activity. It is about the relationships that are developed over time by being alongside um, young people and, and the youth workers. And I suppose one of the things that a lot of our members are, are struggling with in many ways is this lack of clar clarity around guidance on what they can do when you know for example and it's it's relevant to colleagues that are that are on the call as well um you if you have a fully outdoor nursery then you can be uh, delivering your activities at the moment but if you're uh, delivering outdoor activities as a youth group you're not able to do that at the moment because there is no guidance which says that you can do that and while there was some some commentary last week about it's not possible to provide guidance for for every sector and every situation that has ramifications for um, the safe and effective operation of youth groups or indeed many organizations for example if something goes wrong and your insurance asks you do you were you operating within the government guidelines at that point in time? You cannot say yes. So therefore, you'd be operating in an unsafe way. Um, and that puts the, the, the future of your youth group, small, medium or large, um, at risk. Um, so there's, there's, there's two bits, really, two points that really I'd like to, to make in that sense is how do we ensure that we can return to some form of face-to-face -face activity as, as soon as possible, particularly where there are youth groups across the country of all shapes and sizes who want to deliver summer programmes and want to work with young people to enable them to return into school, whatever that does look like. And how can we ensure that they do so and are supported to do so with clear guidance as, as early as possible? Because I know there is guidance being worked on, but nothing seems to be addressing these fundamental issues as yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, is that okay? Oh, sorry. My apologies. 
Um, yeah, uh, I, I was saying there's quite a few topics in the chat now, but um, if we could stick to, to um, deprivation and, and digital exclusion, I think Kerry wanted to come in on that point. Yes, thank you. So um, just to give um, an example of uh, digital exclusion, I think um, for those young people who are at still at school, um, there has been opportunity for them to get devices through schools, but there is concern about the 16 plus age group, young people who are maybe not in education, employment or training. Um, and in uh, as, as a concrete example, in Paisley alone, our YMCA, which operates just on the uh, next to Fergusley Park, um, knows of 108 16 plus young people who have no access to a digital device or to data. And that's just one community. Um, and I think there is a gap there in terms of how those young people are being resourced. Um, Paisley is a very good example of where the local authority has engaged um, with the third sector in discussions around contribution to learning, particularly because that YMCA is doing a lot of work around uh, STEM education. Um, but um, in answer to, to Daniel's question and, um, and coming in on what Louise was saying, our experience um, is not good across the board in terms of um, uh, local authorities um, considering extending their school estate as was in the guidance um, and you know we have some YMCA's with big community halls that could be used um, as additional resource and space um, and um, the majority of the experience would be that it is very difficult to engage with the schools um, and I think whereas Tim said that youth work has been engaging with the schools I think my argument would be Youth workers have, but they've tended to be local authority youth workers and the third sector has has again, unfortunately, been been excluded in many situations um, from that engagement at this point in time. Thank you. Katie, you wanted to come back in. Are oh, you still on mute? You're still on mute. <laughs> um, so um, two points. First of all, just to uh, following up in terms of what Mark was saying about you know when can we re-engage face to face I mean I was on a meeting this morning with my colleagues from England, Wales and Northern Ireland and in England and Northern Ireland they are expecting to be able to resume face to face provision on the 4th of July and they are getting guidance um, and assistance with developing frameworks and tools from their respective governments um, so that, that was quite I found that very interesting that they expect to be able to move so quickly um, but the other point I wanted to raise was about the, how the impact isn't equal and how um, it is worse in areas of deprivation. Um, and I think it will get worse as it carries on. So you know, young people in, in areas of deprivation are currently digitally excluded. But as we move to face to face provision, um, that's where the provision is going to fail first. So as school lets are not available, um, so if you don't have your own premise and you normally meet in the school or the church or the community centre, these places are not going to be opening back up to any kind of community provision, except for apparently Edinburgh, who have made an announcement today that they are going to look at different um, uh, buildings for community groups. Other places across Scotland are telling us, forget it, it's, it's just not going to happen. We've got to clean the schools for the kids coming back next week, so you can't come in. Um, so these are the areas, and we've, we've spent the last four or five years establishing um, a lot of new provision in areas of deprivation, but they don't have their own halls. So we're now trying to look at our wider estates to see how can we share that, but sometimes, geographically, sometimes they're just not located in the same places. Um, so there's definitely an unequal impact. But the one place that sector that's really keen to speak to us is private schools. They are very keen for us to support them with um, relaunching their Duke of Edinburgh provision and upscaling their teachers to deliver outdoor education. So, you know, another example of where the impact is very unequal for our young people. OK, thank, thank you, Katie. Um, my colleague Ian was wanting to come in with a supplementary question. Thanks. I think that's you, Ian. Oh, you're back on mute. You went off mute. That's you. There's a bit of lag and then you try again and you switch yourself off again. Sorry. Uh, I wanted to follow up this, this, this point. Mark started on it and Katie referred to it too about 
Um, just to be clear that there's no provisional date or indicative date or any indication at all of when face-to-face -face work might re return. Um, and also no guidance about how that might happen. But I wanted to ask Mark, you said guidance was being worked on and I just wondered by who, where, where is that happening? Is it okay to come back yes, in? Mark, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we know that there is um, CLD sector specific guidance being uh, developed um, and we have been contributing uh, to that. Um, however, it, it doesn't go into, it, it's fairly big picture. It doesn't go into the specific detail that small community-based youth groups really need, um, really need to know about what they can do with who and, and when. Um, and to the extent that, that we have producing, been producing guidance to, to try and distill some of the national guidance and make it um, relative for uh, our member youth groups. Um, but we still lack that that information that um, Katie's just provided, uh, shared has been provided um, south of the border more recently. Um, now, that's not to say that it... <sighs> yeah, I, I, I don't know um, why we, we can't have some of some of that uh, detail around a date that just says we can aim for this when there are other sectors um, uh, out with youth work um, that, that are having that. Um, it would certainly be helpful uh, at this point in time. Um, I'm going to bring Khalida back in on the young people and the future impacts. Thank you. Um, so there, for, for us, um, what we're seeing is that there's inadequate culturally appropriate youth services for BAME young people across Scotland who don't engage with, with current services. BAME young people are in a dangerous situation which will cause structural disadvantage to de deepen and implicit bias which could influence a teacher's decision to give a pupil a lower mark on assessments throughout the year and influence their final estimated grades. There is evidence that young BAME Scots will face challenges, challenges receiving estimate grades from teachers. Schools in less affluent areas will not have the previous performance privileges. As a result, there's greater risk of disadvantaged pupils from lower socioeconomic background and from ethnic minority backgrounds. It's already highlighted in the Race Equality Action Plan before COVID and the murders of black innocent people. Young BAME Scots are more at risk of leaving school with no positive destination and no support to assist in making timely and positive decisions as there is lack of culturally appropriate street style support services to support them. In November, as I've, I've shared with you, a first of its kind, we, we launched uh, a report on the perceptions and experience of young BAME Scots in, um, in, uh, in sc Scottish schools. And racism is a, a major concern, and that's now amplified due to COVID-19. All young BAME Scots right now are seeing is police murders and brutality. Organisations who have never spoken out for them are now following the trend on the hashtag tag Black Lives Matter and it's not a trend, it's, it is Black Lives. High numbers of their communities are dying from COVID. This together um, with the thought of going back to school and having to face racism and microaggressions is all too much and traumatising for young people. Um, they, they will most definitely experience difficulty coping and adapting to severe events, what they've recently went through. And, you know, we have to remember, they're not just seeing this like we see on TV, we see on YouTube. They're seeing it and they're actually feeling it. There, there's little, what, what young people are seeing right now on social media is, is they're suddenly realising their history because it's not taught in schools. They're realising uh, what happened to, to their ancestors and how they were treated. The information is all out there on social media and it's, it's having a negative impact. And there's studies to show that young people from these backgrounds are le less likely to access mental health services, counselling, because the, the people, at the, the role models, the people, the leaders are not from their cultural background. They can't give a culturally appropriate responses. Thank you. 
Thank you, Calida. Um, Tim, uh, you wanted to come back in as well. I don't know if that was in the previous point. Sorry, I missed you. It was, yeah, I was just to say that um, I suppose in an ideal world, again, we would have been part of the, the guidance with government around education settings and community settings and leisure. And one of the challenges, one of the, one of the joys of youth work, but also one of the challenges is that it, it is varied. So you will get slightly different approaches through the voluntary sector. You'll have um, outdoor programmes. You've got people working in schools along with schools. Um, and uh, and a myriad of other other kind of activity, including stuff that you know opportunities for young people in terms of sport as well and activity. So um, it is something that we felt it would have been good to be that we had to ask for. Um, but it is good that it is developing now. There is wider CLD guidance. It is very overlap over, uh, generic. What we're trying to do ourselves. I know that Youth Scotland have developed some guidance. We, we're also working with outdoor learning and youth work guidance specifically, so that we can you know get the most relevant information to people to then make their own decisions at a local authority and um, within their own voluntary organisations, because it will always be co context specific. But that doesn't take away from the, the overall point about certainty and clarity about dates for face to face contact that was being made. And that 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 direction really does need to come from from uh, the government and public health. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Dave Spence wanted to come in. Yes, thank you. I was just saying with the uh, teachers are being asked to return reopen schools looking at three strands they need to upgrade in terms of digital teaching they need to deal with young people with social distancing distancing in schools and they need to get young people outdoors getting outdoors is the safest place for young people to be the uh, transmission incidence outdoors is vanishingly small so it's the outdoor learning specialists can support people to understand the benefits of being outdoors and to make that practical. We deal with uh, quite rigorous risk assessments and standard operating procedures uh, all the time to consider the requirements for COVID or post-COVID is just another layer of health and safety for us. So we can help schools and we're working with a couple of schools to try and see how we can support them uh, going back to uh when they reopen in the september we're looking at programs to help them specifically to get out of doors the thing is to do that we're having to go and help them get find funding from other sources uh, if we we if we're really going to make a contribution a significant contribution to this we could do with central government support for that financial support if we are looking for support from local authorities i'm afraid it's just not going to happen the thing is that there are enormous opportunities, I think. We are changes being forced upon us and we can make we can create a new way of uh, of working with the third sector playing a more significant role. It's just that we need to um, uh, really ha create the space for that to happen. We can provide the examples of there's you know plenty of examples of, of excellent work. We just need to uh, make sure we get some support so that we can uh, roll these out and to be so, so they can be uh, appear in society in this through schools and with young people uh, more uh, often than they get now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, um, just looking, um, uh, pro probably just um, uh, Khalida was wanting in again on our next topic, which is youth work's role in the COVID recovery. Um, do you want to come back in again, Khalida? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so, yeah, it would be in the committee's interest to extend, as I said, the review and have a series of committee meetings to have a specific focus on BAME young people. BAME young people must be put on the youth work agenda. Organisations and schools must resist tokenistic gestures and develop meaningful and genuine participation with specialist youth work organisations who can evidence effective engagement for 13 to 19 year olds. It is clear that schools are not preparing to support specific trauma experienced by young BAME Scots due to COVID and the Black Lives Matter and the even heavier weight that will be held by pupils on their return are they likely to suffer more than other young people, specialist youth work is needed. We need to build a platform for BAME young people with lived experience to take a leading role in services in their education by influencing teacher teaching and pra practice and content with working with a whole school approach. You, the youth work and education must become aware that BAME young people face 
additional, often unforeseen challenges on the basis of colour, nationality, ethnicity, culture or national origin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else want to come in on that specific area of, of recovery? We've touched on it slightly in other areas, but... Um, uh, Tim, yeah? Yeah, I just, just wanted to pick up on some of the things that uh, Khalida has been saying, and I think it's very important that um, that we that we listen and um, connect um, in terms of the the national youth work strategy, the co-production um, of that youth work strategy um, uh, with young people and with the sector and with the Scottish government has been very keen to. One of the key issues was about youth work being open and accessible to all. Um, and it had a very much a, a kind of focus on ensuring that all looked at, you know, whether it's looked after and accommodated young people, young people from BAME communities, we need to kind of do more to to um, understand what what their the issues are that, that young people are facing and ensuring that's part of our of our youth work strategy. And in the wider um, umbrella of, of our work at Youth Link Scotland, in terms of the Action on Prejudice uh, website, tackling hate crime that we lead on, um, Action on Sectarianism, and our own um, pursuit as an organisation to to have an investor in diversity status, we're, we're kind of very very aware that um, you know that, that there's there's a lot of work to do, and that has been highlighted again through some of the the recent. Um, in, interested in awareness um, um, through Black Lives Matter. So um, certainly I, I know that I've, I've chatted to Khalida about shadowing her for a day. And I think as a sector, we certainly want to, to appreciate and understand the specific um, concerns that, that she is raising today. OK, thank you, Tim. Louise? Yeah, I just want, just when you were asking about youth work's role, I just, um, just wanted to touch on when Tim mentioned the the report at the start. Um, one of the key headings was obviously mental health and well-being, and just to flag that that's something that the trust is very much seen as a, a kind of decline in um, the well-being of young people. And um, we conducted a a YouGov poll um, at the start of of kind of well earlier on in, in lockdown. Um, and we found that there'd been a real increase in the anxiety of young people. Obviously, you know, their their future prospects are um, not looking great. And, and obviously that's continued and probably worsened in the last few weeks as the statistics have come out and the kind of um, economic forecasting and kind of pending jobs crisis. So I think um, and I think that's where youth work have a really positive role to play there as well. I mean, uh, I heard a great case study just yesterday of a colleague who has been just staying in touch, phone calls twice a week with a young person in Dundee. Um, it's had a, they have you know, said it's had a massive impact for them of just having someone to check in with who isn't in the family, having that continued you know, key worker support and um, some of that goal setting. And I think it's, it's just to highlight again that I think um, Sometimes mental health and uh, well-being can be very much boxed into quite almost a clinical, medicalised um, area. And actually, I think, you know, there's so much research and data to show that youth work can have such a positive impact for young people in terms of their confidence and that goal setting piece and just feeling that they've got somebody in their corner. And I think that's going to be really important. Um, and that's obviously one of the scary things behind the this sustainability of the sector and where will we be in six months because I think young people are going to need us from that point of view more than ever. It's one of the areas for the committee's work um, was um, kibosh by COVID if you like because the um, we were looking at, at the introduction of counsellors in schools and we wanted to do some work on um, where that had been done previously and, and, and things that obviously um, COVID stopped all of that work for ourselves as well at this point in time. Um, in terms of the um, the, the recovery, I, I mean, we've touched very much on the sustainability. I think we're all getting the message of the sustainability in the long term of youth work. Um, but the, the last question that we were given was about access to youth work as part of the education. Now, I live in North Lanarkshire, um, so, so my schools are very much linked into this and I see many of the, the, the awards network organisations at um, embedded into school curriculums and given opportunities to young people um, 
and uh, uh, it, it's you know and, and and the Duke of Edinburgh being delivered in you know, Cal Calavita I think in about the um the cost of that but uh, you know but embedded in the curriculum as part of the offer to young people so uh, I mean going forward what do, do, do you see a change and I, it, it's all also quite disappointing to hear that in, in terms of getting back to normality you seem to have been cut out of that process so so given the um education scotland's um information to us that this is part of you know the new curriculum and part of young people's development do you think this, that there has been a lack of leadership at this stage to actually embed that in youth work into immediate recovery phase and how do you see that going on in the long term so pretty long-winded question there sorry <laughs> I see Tim's got his hand up already thank you I'm not sure I'm going to address the, the, the whole question in a few seconds but um, I, I guess that the um, that there is um, involvement of of youth work alongside schools and it's important just to remember it's, it's youth work and schools it's not just what's part of the, the formal curriculum it's it's lots of the stuff that happens in the evenings and the weekends and the summer holidays too which has a, a positive impact on young people's achievement and attainment as well um, and transition support um, in particular so I, I think it's um, you know I think that in the, in the policy terms and in what's written down you will see youth work you will see community learning and development within that you will see um, Education Scotland with um, CLD regional improvement teams and, and advice but um, I think what, what the worry or the concern would be in the, in, the, in the rush to get schools back it has been a, a recovery of schools plan rather than a, an education recovery plan and that's, I think, what we're, we're, say, we're saying. So it's not that this previous work in the area around youth work and schools was developing, was moving moving forward, but the, the gulf and the potential challenge, especially around um, a widening attainment gap, which you know there's a lot of people rightly concerned about. I think it's just ensuring that youth work has a, a huge role to play, especially with um, young people in, in marginalised and, and you know, young people in, in poverty, and and uh, we we need to see that as as one of the priorities, not a not an add on. Okay, um, can I bring um, Kerry in first? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think if I'm being um, very honest, um, until there is some ring fencing of um, part of the PEF budget. For youth work, there's not going to be um, a parity in terms of the impact that youth work can have as part of education, because what our experience is, is that um, where youth work works well in schools, it's where you've got a head teacher who's abs absolutely sees the value of it. But that is not every school, unfortunately. And so you're almost at the whim of um, uh, a head teacher's choice or kind of a local authority, um, you know, structure and decision making. So I would really urge some consideration around um, part of the PEF budget being ring fenced for, for youth work, because I think that would make a huge difference. OK, Mark, you wanted to come in? Hi, uh, yeah, it was just on the, the issue around mental health. I mean, one of the things that, that we know in youth work and community based youth work is that youth workers can often be a trusted adult that, that young people will turn to um, when their lives are turned upside down, when they need support, when they need space. Um, and I think as we talk about the youth work's role in the recovery, we've, we don't need to, to go over all, all the ground around the, the impact on, on people's mental health that this crisis is having. Um, but youth work has a vital role in supporting young people now and as we, we work our way through whatever the future is going to look like. You know, having that space in the community for them to come together to explore their issues, their thoughts, their anxieties, their hopes and their fears, um, and to have someone that just allows them to, to give them that space to do so is incredibly important. Um, but equally alongside that, we need to ensure that youth workers, and it's not just about um, training uh, people in schools to be able to support young people's mental health. Youth workers, because they are that point that, that young people will turn to, they need to be supported to understand how to identify mental health issues, mental health concerns, where young people can do with more interventionalist support and where they need um, space uh, to, to work through issues. Um, I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been Louise was talking about the role that, that youth work can have in, in that early intervention, pre-CAMS, pre-clinical 
um, more interventionalist and specialist support. But if we're going to support young people uh, going forward, youth work's role in, in creating that space to support their mental health and well-being, it, it can't be overlooked. And there's a danger that it always has been. Um, but if we continue to do so now, then we're just creating an even bigger problem. Okay, um, uh, I've got Dave wanting to come in as well. Thank you. I said earlier that the situation has been in um, a pile of state for some time. For decades now, um, residential centres have been closing. And uh, that was uh, quite serious before COVID-19, with about half a dozen centres saying they were closed, going to close, or, or signal that they would do in a, few, in a year's time. The as the time has gone on and it's got worse and worse, that it's exposed the great fault line between local authority provision and third sex provision. And it is very difficult to create a level playing field uh, when the, there are two sides uh, um, against each other, operating against each other like that. Uh, we very rarely get the support from local authorities they don't work in partnership with us as, as we might expect they would uh, there is a tendency for them to uh, keep us at arm's length as much as possible and really as we are having this change forced upon us i think there is a case to say uh, encourage local authorities to stop delivering seeing themselves as delivery agents and leave that to the third sector to expand and grow uh, if we get some support at this time, and it is urgent that we do, within a year's time, we as charities and social enterprises will be trading again. We will be bringing in uh, our own income again, uh, sustaining jobs throughout Scotland and bringing in philanthropic support. If you give support to local authorities at this time, local authority outdoor centres, I'm afraid, they will come again next year for the same amount again and again and again. The situation is reaching breaking point. Ten years of austerity has nearly put paid to residential provision by local authorities. Another several years, I won't say ten years again, but uh, several years of austerity to come will probably change the position emphatically. Uh, the, now is the time to create a new structure, uh, a new uh, public policy structure that sees a great role for the third sector. Um, and that's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim, I see your hand up. Did you want to come back in? Um, no, I appreciate the time's limited. It was really a, around mental health and wellbeing and to say that, you know, in terms of youth work's involvement in mental health and wellbeing, it's clear that that was increasing and needing to increase in terms of prevention before this crisis. And this crisis just underlined the need even more to um, to revisit that and see what different roles that youth work organisations can play to support young people's um, health and wellbeing. And I, I am very conscious of time and I've got a lot to, to, to take forward from today's meeting. I just wondered if any of my colleagues wanted to come in just before the end. Looking to Beatrice, do you want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted, I haven't said anything throughout this because I've been listening quite intently and taking notes and hearing what everybody's been saying. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for the time and I have heard what you've said. Okay, I'm looking to Daniel or Ian. Does that either, yeah, Ian, you want to come in? No? You're fine, Daniel. You're okay. Um, I have to say um, yeah, uh, thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to everyone else who's contributed this afternoon. It has been really, really helpful and we've a lot to take away from it. Um, certainly things that we will be coming back to. And uh, as I said, um, Khalid, it would be really really look forward to seeing that report in July when it comes forward. Um, I think this this was um, a focus group for now, um, but we will be um, discussing it with our other members of the committee and deciding how we may take this forward. Obviously, we're into um, recess as it is this this time uh, next week, but we don't know what, what we might be coming up over the summer. Um, it's certainly not a, a, a recess as normal, and the committee will be keeping a very active view on what's happening in the sector. So um, thank you, everyone. Um, there will be a note of today made up, but I can just assure everybody that everything, no, nothing will be attributed to a particular person um, who's who's spoken out um, today. Um, it's a sort of Chatham House note that will be presented for the rest of the committee. But we do really appreciate everyone taking 
part this afternoon and um, and please if if anything else comes up if there's something that you need to feel the committee needs to to know about between now and when we might be meeting again if you if you please could um, let our clerks know and we'll ensure that the committee is made aware of that um i think um joy joy is all oh, joy is saying that um everyone signed consent forms so that the session might actually be going live so i hadn't appreciated that before today so um it's likely that the recording will go up um at some point soon but thank you very much for taking part this afternoon uh, really appreciate it and thank you to my colleagues as well and that's close the meeting thank you bye